You are listening to a Sustainable World Radio podcast. Sustainable World Radio brings you in-depth interviews, news, and commentary about positive solutions to environmental challenges. Solutions that adhere to the permaculture ethics of earth care, people care, fair share. Are you interested in learning more about permaculture projects around the globe? How to plant a food forest? Restorative design or ethnobotany? Then stay tuned for Sustainable World Radio. I'm your host and producer, Jill Cloutier. Our guest today is Sasha Dewar. Sasha is a natural dyer, designer, artist, and educator. Her books include Natural Color and Natural Palettes, Inspiration from Plant-Based Color. Sasha is the founder of the Perma Couture Institute and a teacher at the California College of the Arts. Welcome, Sasha. I'm so happy to have you here today. Thank you, Jill. It's my pleasure. And I'm really um, thrilled. I've been loving, I love your books and looking at them, I just want to tell listeners, is just a visual feast. It feeds your eyes these beautiful living colors. And your new book, Natural Palettes, is gorgeous and I was swooning over the perfume and pollinator palettes. Thank you, Jill. Uh, gorgeous. <laughs> oh gosh, it's just stunning. And I think one thing too that people should know is that these color palettes that you feature in your newest book aren't just for natural dyers. You can use these in design and art and all sorts of ways. Well that was definitely an inspiration point for thinking of this book was just the multidimensional aspects of working with plants and also as an artist how the process can really pull you into a full sensory like mode in order to create which is I would say a win-win-win mm. on all fronts. Mm-hmm. And so, Sasha, your journey into natural dyeing started when you were an art student, and you felt sick. You had some reactions to using oil paints, and I, I believe that mm-hmm. sensitivity spurred you on to what you call a soil-to-studio journey. Can you just tell us a bit about what happened then? Yeah, I mean, ironically, I was a painting student, um, and... This was an undergraduate, so I was a studio art major, and I was working on a lot of large-scale oil paintings about transformations in nature, which was my subject of choice. And so I was looking at, you know, like how a flower may go from a seed to a flower and what those in-between moments looked like in abstract. So I was thinking a lot about nature, but I was working with uh, materials that were actually making me sick and preventing me from kind of getting to the point of what I was working with. And at some point, I remember this was in Vermont, I remember having to exit my class and just going feeling so sick, I had to go outside into the snow and just like, full on nausea. And it was at that point where I was like, this is not working for me, I have to figure out some other mode. And so I became more inquisitive just about sources of materials um, and what I might be able to work with as an artist and to be able to express the work and, you know, the kind of concepts that I was trying to get at. And it actually was fairly difficult, which I found surprising to find um, resources to work with at that point. And none of my professors really knew how to work with me or what, you know, what the next steps were. And I started on a series of just, you know, personal, I guess, journeys. (laughs) And, you know, ironically, like where it brought me to was working a lot with um, people from communities that I had grown up with and particularly women on farms, and also digging a bit deeper into indigenous cultures um, and recognizing that a lot of this knowledge was still there (laughs) and has been there and is as easy as walking out onto your sidewalk at some point or in your backyard. And it was really this depth and knowledge about plants that in our uh, contemporary culture had been more difficult to access for various reasons. Um, And at that point, 
I think I became a bit more about, you know, activism surrounding that because it was so accessible and yet unaccessible in a way. Um, it drew a lot of parallels in my mind uh, towards issues that were happening with food um, at the time too. This was like in late the late 1990s, early 2000s, and um, a lot of what was happening with urban agriculture and just thinking about, you know, how you can grow your own food, just even in your backyard, no matter where you are. And it got me thinking about materials, like as an artist, but also for um, textiles and design, too. So it really had a far reaching um, impact on your life and your work. It did. Yeah. I mean, step by step. But yeah, <laughs> it really did. And so, you know, you you say that, you um, natural color and natural dyeing, and you, you touched on this just then, but you say that um, dyeing with natural materials really gets us back. It connects us with seasonality, nature, it increases our ecological literacy. And I love that idea of how this craft or art, you know, art that we do, passion and addiction, as we were talking earlier, um, can really influence your whole life and change your outlook on the world. It's true. I mean, I think for me, it's just that, you know, specifically, it's that wonder of taking something that might be considered waste or a weed even, or, um, you know, a, maybe a plant that you never noticed before, but has been with you the whole time. And understanding how many different ways that plant expresses itself, like, you know, or how you can work with it as a human being even, and being able to use um, you know, say a discarded peel, like both even as medicine and as color and, you know, particularly, or maybe even as um, nutrients for the soil. And, you know, on that front, it's just, there really is a sense of wonder almost embedded into it because you start to see just like how much in between or how much almost is invisible in the daily life um, that plants offer or, you know, have an a, an ability to share with us if we know how to work with it, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so that, that to me is kind of the fascinating aspect of thinking about a palette that way or thinking about one's materials that way is how many benefits, um, you know, there are to thinking about a pollinator plant, for instance, that you can plant in your garden. Um, that's helpful to local bees and fauna and flora. And at the same time, when when that plant has reached its peak, you can then harvest it for an additional aspect of bringing color into your into your home or into your wardrobe or into your art practice. Um, and even when you're done working with that, say as a dye bath, you may even be able to pour that back into your garden and start anew. And so there is that real sense of like feeling connection, even in something that might otherwise like be a mundane action of, you know, say accessing art materials from a traditional or a uh, not traditional, but like a, you know, a source that's more mainstream and not having any of that interaction. Um, and so, yeah, to me, I think there's something very powerful about thinking about our, our creativity and our artistic practice in sync with everyday activities and being able to add value to that in the process. And it really has far reaching benefits, not only for us and our lives, but also for the environment as well. Absolutely. As we said, it reduces yeah. waste. And I want to I want to get into that in a bit, but mm -hmm. just so people know, um, I want to compare and contrast synthetic dyes with natural dyes or what you term living color, which I just love. Um, do you know mm -hmm. what most of our clothes are being dyed with on a commercial scale? Well, synthetic chemicals and particularly chemicals that have adverse reactions <laughs> for people who work with it, as well as, you know, what goes into materials. And unfortunately, like something that I've noticed in my ongoing teaching practice and research and, you know, just being a citizen of this planet, but, um, you know, fast fashion is often built upon principles of disposability. And I think that's really ironic because many of the dyes that are chosen for synthetic reasons are chosen because they are cheap. Um, they are often, you know, come from 
toxic slash oil-based uh, origins, and they are meant to be permanent for a disposable <laughs> industry. And so that, to me, has, has always been quite ironic. Um, and I think there's a lot to, you know, one of the aspects of having been trained in permaculture and thinking about that in terms of um, how it can be that term and these ideas and ideologies can be applied towards the fashion industry is what would, you know, how can you make a negative a positive? And sometimes the critiques around natural dyes, oh, you know, they have different life cycles. They, you know, perhaps take more um, care and attention, both for the person who's applying or putting that color into the textile, but also caring for it as a human being or in a, as an individual when you're taking care of your clothes or your textiles or your garment. Um, uh, because, you know, oftentimes it's not like you can throw a naturally dyed item into hot wash and then <laughs> into the dryer the same way you want to take care of the color as, as you would want to take care of a delicate fiber. You would also want to take care of that color so that it preserves and lasts longer. And so there's, you know, there's all of these negatives that people are like, I don't want to go through that work, or I want something that's going to last and be stable forever. But the reality is that dress may last in you know one person's closet for six months and then end up in a disposable uh you know landfill unfortunately and then that maybe that fiber breaks down but that color doesn't break down and that color then becomes part of our soil and part of our um, ecosystem in adverse ways and so you know at the same time if you're working with maybe a color that you've cared for or that has even health benefits to it as many natural dyes are um, you know made from plants that have anti antimicrobial aspects or can be soothing or even you know have healing aspects to the plant itself in the process um, of applying it that there or it can become fertilizer for the soil and not um, you know, not something that's polluting it or preventing it from being um, soil that is healthy or accessible to the community in which it's, you know, these chemicals are dumped into eventually. So, I mean, I feel that there are all these conversation starters with just systems and, you know, how we expect color to be perhaps in our material lives versus the many benefits and many ways we can change behavior and also have additional knowledge or maybe aha moments around, say, a persimmon dyed jacket um, then becomes something that is both very stable and maybe even gets darker over time with sun exposure, but can also add strength to the fiber and can be 100% um, you know, healthy for the person who both supplied it, the person who's wearing it, and even whatever happens to the garment eventually to the soil that takes it back in. So, you know, these are very simplified versions because it's complex, our material uh, economy and, and life. But I think there's a lot of benefits to thinking about color differently. And the color too, I often wonder, because I have had, I'm sure you've had this, especially as a college student and teen where I would buy cheap clothes. And then I remember wearing these fuchsia pants out in the rain once <laughs> and my legs were fuchsia. Mm -hmm. And I just, what? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and right. denim, remember denim doing the same thing. And I just wonder, our skin yeah. is our largest organ. So what impact, I, I wonder if studies have been done, do these dyes and chemicals used on our fibers have on our skin and body? Yeah, I mean, there are studies out there. And, um, actually, Greenpeace does some interesting, uh, you know, toxic fashion reports, um, as well as Fiber Shed is another great resource. And I love books by Kate Fletcher, too. And so those are all great places to get, you know, some very specific statistics around toxicity and specifically dye and clothing. Uh, but I would say uh, just from, again, a common sense perspective, when you do think about that, the, there is that element of, you know, our society wants permanence <laughs> and really what is an ever-changing aspect of, you know, things do 
come in and out of our lives and they do just dispose and you know like the darker dyes especially synthetic dyes are typically loaded with the most carcinogens and you know oftentimes textiles too that are meant to be like say flame retardant for sleeping on or you know something you come in contact with in your daily life these chemicals really do have like pretty intense aspects to both the person coming in contact with it and, you know, especially the, the origins of where it comes from and the workers who are exposed to those chemicals in the first place. It's just so sad to me to think about people having to work with these chemicals in factories, getting paid really low wages just for an outfit that might be worn once. Yeah, I mean, I would say there's a lot of benefit to, again, considering the ingredients that come into your life and, you know, both before it gets to you, like who may be working with them prior and where they're going afterwards. It's Also often polyester and all these materials that won't biodegrade. That was years ago, I started not buying any clothes that wouldn't biodegrade. Mm -hmm. And it was challenging, especially, yeah, yeah, lately, it's just everything has polyester. Yeah, I know. I'm so particular to you because, <laughs> you know, being a textile professor and, um, you know, it's, it's, it's hard, you know, it is, it is difficult, I think, for the common consumer. But it, it, one of the things of working with plant-based dyes is that it's been a really great way for me to embed meaning into items in my wardrobe or in my home that um, are, you know, plant-based dyes work really well with protein fibers or cellulose fibers, so natural fibers in general. And so being able to go to a thrift store and just, you know, being on the lookout for, oh, this is a great wool sweater, you know, that I can keep (laughs) buying or adding layers to over time and giving it new life or, you know, being able to just keep experimenting. And that's been like, it's kind of a nice base is just knowing like the more, natural fibers that come into your life, like whether you're able to support the artisan who's bringing in organics or, you know, a company that has ethics that you believe in and bring new things into your life or being able to see what you may already have or bring into your life through thrift or, um, you know, other modes. Working with plant dyes is so accessible. It's like being a chef in your kitchen or in your backyard. Um, And, it's just such a nice way to take one dress and keep adding to it and feeling like you have given something new life, even though it's been with you the whole time and evolving it. And, you know, like we have a natural desire as human beings to want to express ourselves creatively through our, you know, material surroundings or through our garments. And I think working with plants um, and color from that perspective or from that or- origin is a really great way to satisfy that and satiate it and to have like, you know, to add to that zero waste lifestyle, like literally from like the compost of your favorite meal <laughs> to a sweater, you might be like, oh, I'm tired of that yellow. Well, you know, now is a chance to like over it with like, say, you know, I'm just thinking of something, but like onion skins and, you know, give it a next bump up of orange or, you know, whatever it is. And it's like, it's, it really does connect all the dots in terms of like, you know, bringing materials, like making something out of nothing essentially and giving it more meaning. Like I've often found too, it's when I have hand dyed something or somebody else has for me, you feel a connection to it. And I think that's kind of an essential part of wanting to take care of something, um, which is, you know, sadly, sorely (laughs) lacking, um, as you know, in our disposability of how much is viewed these days. So. So true. And we were talking earlier and I was saying the only drawback for me of natural dyeing, not even for me, but has been for my partner, Kevin, Mm -hmm. because he'll find, I was telling Sasha, (laughs) he'll find like bags of frozen plants and like, why is the freezer so full? (laughs) 
<laughs> then I think, oh, no. And he starts digging around. It's like, what is this? And it's like, oh, my God, it's my frozen sour grass. Or, oh, that's the carrot tops I was saving. Yeah. Or, oh. And then he'll come in from work. And right. He'll be like, oh, my God, you're cooking plants again. So I, now I have a burner and I'm outside. <laughs> Not all of them smell yeah. as good as redwood no, I've, cones. I've... <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's so true. Redwood cones is an amazing smelling oh dye, for sure. We started in the textile program at California College of the Arts. We did start to phase out plants like alkanet root because it mm. smells like dirty gym socks <laughs> and went towards the redwood cones or towards, you know, the rosemary. Um, because it was, you know, it was just out of common courtesy to the collect, to, yeah. to the collective. <laughs> oh my gosh. But it is true. And working, working outside does help. Like I will say I have come to being a gardener and a chef through my love of natural dyeing. Like I was a natural dyer first, but it has certainly helped me in both respects. Like, And working outside helps you get to the compost pile faster instead of, you know, the the mystery bags in the kitchen. <laughs> so. It's so true. And I love your idea of like, I, like mining your compost pile. It's kind of like, what is the potential of the compost pile in natural dyeing? Tell us a bit about that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, for me, it's like another aspect, which, you know, most natural dyers recognize and advocate for is that a lot of what is considered waste or weeds in our, um, you know, in, in, in most perspectives make really great dyes. And so that to me has always been like, this is such a, it's a gift really, (laughs) you know, it's like, you can eat your pomegranate and then you have the rinds and, you know, and or like your carrots and then you have your tops. And it's like, you know, it's a really wonderful way of thinking about the whole plant and not having waste. Um, And then also too, in your yard, you know, like even what you can find just from what pops up naturally, whether it's weeds or, you know, maybe overzealous, um, I'm just thinking about passion fruit vines, which can take over, you know, a back fence or branches that may naturally need pruning. I mean, that was another part I really wanted to bring into natural palettes was just thinking about participation. Um, Because, you know, when I view a Pantone book or thinking about Pantone palettes, to me, there's both a separation because it's a very surface version of color. Like you're just looking at color as, you know, maybe a one dimension aspect of this is what I'm seeing in the world versus maybe, you know, that other level of like, well, this is what the world has, which you need to participate to access. So, um, you know, I guess I would say like with the Pantone palettes, there's no other added sensory aspect that comes into the making of it or, you know, like different versions of how you would get these colors. Whereas, for instance, if you're creating a palette, um, I have one palette in this book called Orchard Pruning. And so it's all the different colors you can get from fruit trees um, from their pruning when they often need to be pruned, most likely in the winter or early spring Um and taking those prunings, which can help your trees produce more and become a more abundant source of food and to create beautiful colors at the same time. And so there's, you know, to me, that's really something special is thinking about the participation aspect. And, you know, sometimes it's hard for partners when you participate a little too much, <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's, it's a great, it's a great way to have meaning and to create you know, to create concept and also to literally be able to, to connect and even give back to your, you know, to your environs as as a part of it. And I think that's important. Me too. And, you know, I really can see how on a macro level, this could be applied to um, cover crops, like leftover cover crops, or what about invasive Mm -hmm. weeds? And, you know, as I prepared for the interview, I kept thinking about essential oil, like the burgeoning essential oil industry and all of that weight, you know, the plant Mm -hmm. material. There's so many opportunities to use this waste. There's so much opportunity. And that was another that was another thing I tried to just, you know, touch upon in different points in this book, because I do 
often consult with larger companies and fashion industries, um, you know, and some of them really are looking at ways to involve, um, you know, the resources they have in terms of technology, thinking about the next generations coming up, like specifically Gen Z, who I think is more open to ideas of, say, a medicinally dyed T-shirt or, you know, a garment or a home item that they participate with and, you know, thinking about it just a little bit more fluidly than perhaps generations above have thought about it in the past. And so I think it is kind of an interesting time. Um, and, you know, in terms of invasive plants or even, um, you know, industry, like, for instance, Hops, I think, is an interesting <laughs> guy to consider um, because there are there there often are a lot of um, byproducts or waste products that naturally occur in different forms um, from industries we participate with or partake in, and I think that there's a lot of experimentation and collaborations coming up um, that could be really beneficial and could be interesting in certain ways, particularly for color or for textiles. Hmm. That's wonderful. And really, it, it takes us to the permaculture principle about waste and producing no waste. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Totally. Yeah. It's exciting. Right. Yes. And that's a key component. Mm -hmm. Then circular design. I mean, I think that's like, that's another, um, you know, that's another key component towards thinking about the future of fashion and textiles and where that all and color and design and material culture, you know, it doesn't end there, but circular design and these conversations, you know, the more we know and the more we start to understand about how, you know, systems or communities or even social practice in terms of, you know, what people consider waste, because that's always a question too, um, and identifying that and then being able to, create additional economies out of it, I think is really fascinating. It's really exciting. There's a lot of opportunity here. And other benefits, too, of living color, as you call it, um, it can have a ripple effect. And I, we talked a bit about this in the beginning of supporting ecosystems and also decreasing our carbon footprint. Yeah, totally. Well, you know, again, thinking locally, and the more you get to know, like, which is something else that I think has been really wonderful, um, you know, being a teacher and a professor for the last 15 years is just being able to ignite in students a sense of being able to see what might already be available in their daily interactions and how to work with it creatively and how to problem solve and think of solutions um, towards integrating it into like whether they have a fashion line or whether it's their art practice or, you know, different ways of working in the community and thinking about waste or, um, you know, potential really from the plants that they come in contact with or the people that they know. And, you know, maybe, maybe these collaborations can continue to ignite things that we might not have ever <laughs> have expected, right? And I think that that's a really exciting part is both, you know, the reawakening towards um, potential of one's daily interactions in their communities and with the plants themselves, but also like what collaborations may bring. Like for me personally, it's been really great working with herbalists over, you know, my career as well as with chefs or, you know, botanists or, you know, just generally people who work with plants from a different perspective and being able to communicate and, you know, say, bring together a palette, like a perfume palette, where you're looking at byproducts of plants that may be used for aromatherapy or for the perfume industry um, and the beautiful colors that they can make at the same time and seeing that there, there can be synthesis in um you know, especially as a natural dyer, as a colorist, in working with the byproducts or the waste aspects of it. Um, yeah, it's really like, you know, it does, it does emphasize like the emerging aspect of how many ways there are to create value out of the in-between parts, right? Um, you know, what happens in between a meal to the compost pile? Like what happens in between like, when a, a tree is dormant and needs pruning to it being able to provide more fruit. And, you know, I think that conversation and that collaboration um, 
is one that is a very exciting uh, potential. Oh, I really love the idea of natural color as the fertile ground and the meeting place of all of these different types of plant people, herbalists, botanists, um, natural dyers, all coming together and really working on the waste issue and kind of merging and participating and collaborating. It's really exciting. The other aspect of this, which I find really intriguing, is the idea of um, mitigating climate change and As many of us know, when food scraps or green waste, organic material goes to the landfill, it emits volatile organic compounds, VOCs, which contribute to climate Mm -hmm. change. So this actually could have a big impact on that as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I would also say, too, just thinking locally, which I think was (laughs) where I was initially going with that comment, but thinking locally and being able to work with what you have, um, you know, it really does minimize that climate, you know, just the impact that we each individually have on um, climate change emissions, et cetera. And I think that there's like, you know, it's also limiting like what you bring into your life in a certain way without actually limiting the joy or creativity, um, which is, yes, I mean, I think that's, that's another additional like benefit of being a natural dyer is like again you can take what you have and work with it or share it or be able to communicate very hyper locally um you know whether it's creating something right from your kitchen or it's keeping things from becoming more of an issue in terms of global impact (laughs) so Mm hmm. So true. You know, I recently um, made some tinctures with albizia. Mm-hmm. So I did tincture of the flower, tincture of the bark, and then a friend told me you can make a dye with the leaves. So that was so great. So I ended up using the leaves that I cut oh, off yeah. with the bark. It was really amazing. But it was really interesting how her color was a bright yellow and mine was kind of a <clears throat> rusty orangey rusty color so totally different color and that kind of brings me to how you write that the um, weather the sun the water influences the plants the growing conditions and so with natural dyeing you really can have like you say oh this plant is this gorgeous color and then next year you go back to that plant and it's a totally different color can you speak a bit about that absolutely i mean this is for sure a part of the living color conversation (laughs) which i personally as an artist find fascinating but for some it can be very frustrating um (laughs) but you know i think that's that's it's come a long way um, in terms, I would say, just like food and, and thinking about, say, a bruised apple that is still delicious or, you know, a certain type of um, biodiversity that can come into the food conversation. I think that there is also that similar conversation for textiles in a certain way. And thinking about a... Um, let's just say a living source, for instance, a biological source that is influenced by the terroir of soil and rain and, you know, even cycles that that plant may go through in terms of um, health and vitality, in terms of like whether there was one year where I remember we were collecting fallen olives from a tree in the California College of the Arts parking lot in Oakland. And one year it gave us, you know, it it was a fickle color, but very beautiful blues and purples. And the next year, same time of year, we went and collected these fallen olives and it was just browns. It was so flat and brown. And I remember having this conversation with some friends at the UC Berkeley Botanical Garden and just asking questions about, you know, what was, maybe happening here and they were like well it rained until april and because of that rain the pollination season is really late on these trees and you know it just starts you you start to think about all of the factors that come into the process of something that's alive and affects it individually and it tells a story which i think is really fascinating and makes you know for a very unique color and so you can have a range say of rosemary dye for instance but if that rosemary is flowering you might have a different um 
color that can emerge, or if it's growing in very iron rich soil, or, um, you know, isn't getting the nutrients it needs, or is being fed pesticides, for instance, that all may affect the color in your dye bath, um, as well as whether you're working with city water, or water straight out of, you know, rainwater catchment. These are all things that come into play, and it's not unlike food or a recipe. You know, I know anybody who's probably made sourdough <laughs> during lockdown, mm-hmm. you recognize timing is a factor and ingredients are factors. And, you know, that's so much like the same with natural color and tour with natural color, too. And I just love that. To me, it's one of the key components of um you know, the, the wonder that emerges from all of the factors creating that color story. Hmm, I love it. That's so wonderful. And can you share with our listeners uh, just a couple of your favorite plant dyes? I know it's so hard. (laughs) We were having this discussion earlier, but um, yeah, plant, I, I think it's, hard for me to choose because I just really love the process so much and to me it is about the individual storytelling of collecting or working with the plants Um, but I will say there are a few favorites that I do have (laughs) that I return to again and again one particularly is loquat leaves I just love working with loquat leaves because They are such an abundant, like, especially in California, where I've been working for the last, like, 20 years. Um, It's an abundant tree that can be found in many backyards or on the sidewalk. Um, It can naturally drop its leaves, too. But it is a wonderful dye to work with because you don't have to add anything to the dye bath. All you need are the leaves themselves. And cutting them up and simmering them, um, you can get beautiful corals and pinks and reds, although you would never expect that because it's a dark, waxy green leaf. (laughs) Um, It's also used as as a traditional dye in Japan, um, as well as a medicinal tea, which they call biwa. And so I just love that. Like, I love the fact that it turns into a color you would never expect, that you don't need to add anything to it, and that it's, you know, it's medicinal for you, that it's something that you could actually even drink if you wanted to, which you can't say about any synthetic (laughs) dye. Um, And so to me, it's just, it's just a really an amazing plant. Um, And then if you were to add iron to the dye or to, even if you dyed a coral dress and later dipped it into iron, it would shift to a purpley blue or kind of an inky black, depending on, um, you know, how the depth of your color affected um, what you, what you dipped into. And so, yeah, so that's a favorite of mine. Um, Let's see. I'm thinking about others. Like I, I have so many favorite dyes. <laughs> I'm, just like, I'm just pausing, but um, you know, so that that for sure is one. I love like you know, I re- I really love things that help me engage. Like whether it's something that you know, like just picking up eucalyptus bark, say, like on a walk, which sheds naturally and is really an easy source. And it smells so good in the dye bath too. And so, you know, for me, like there's a number of levels, like going back to redwood cones, <laughs> like, you know, redwood cones, if you were collecting redwood cones in the spring, um, you know, you'll get a different kind of like more, I would say brownish, reddish, pinkish hue. And then if you're collecting them in the fall where they're green, they're much more purple. And so it's like, you know, even thinking about cycles in that sense um, is really beautiful. And then like for, as we were discussing that lovely smell, putting it into a dye bath really evokes like that sense that you're in a coastal rainforest and, um, you know, all those, that was the quickest way back to memory. So for me, it's like, I can be dying like, you know, maybe two yards of fiber or fabric, and I'm in that forest at the same time. And that is like just a magical portal, you know. So those are a few, and I could probably list 500 more. (laughs) You might see all their splotches in my last book, but, (laughs) you know. Oh, my god! And I'm continually surprised, you know. (laughs) I am oftentimes, like, just in awe. I love 
experimenting. Like I really love the aspect and feel so grateful for the work that I get to do because I feel like I get to have a color test kitchen essentially. And I, and, you know, I just love it. I really, um, yeah, I'm so grateful for the process of it. Oh, I do. And pla- I feel like plants have secrets. It's kind of, I was, I made a honeysuckle hydrosol with just a homemade still at home. And I was going to pour the water out, mm-hmm. the leftover water out in the compost. And I looked at it and it was this gorgeous green. And so I just threw in a little handkerchief that I had gotten. Like, I think it was, no, a napkin. I threw in a little napkin I had gotten at the thrift store and just let it soak. No mordant or anything. And it's, it, became this beautiful sagey green and I washed it and it, the green's still there which I was surprised and it smelled like honeysuckle. Oh, I love it. <laughs> Talk mm-hmm. about aromatherapy. Oh, yes it's so it's amazing, wonderful. Amazing right? <laughs> exactly and that was from something you were just about to toss out so. Loquat was my first dye and I because I wanted to make cough medicine and then my friend is into natural dyeing and she said well you, you can dye with it so we did the dye that it is amazing that color i just did it last week too again and did a skirt ah oh, it's gorgeous it's amazing it's true and it's also too like the colors the shades you can get like i've i've worked with um just fashion companies and designers just looking at the variety of shades. So depending on what fibers you put in, or if you put a bunch of different fibers into your dye bath at the same time, pulling out those, um, you know, those various materials and looking at how the dye took in different, on different levels or different hues, I think is just so beautiful. One of my favorite parts of natural dyeing is the, the colors glow. It is, I mean, and in different light, they change color. They do. Oh my gosh. And Kevin was a good sport when I first started natural dyeing. I dyed a sour, I was doing mm-hmm. sour grass, which is another favorite of mine. And he said, oh, throw in my t-shirt. So I threw it in and it was like neon yellow. <laughs> and he wore it to a party mm-hmm. and across the room, like you'd see all these people and then like this giant walking sour grass flower. <laughs> It's, it's so true. I mean, it's funny because that's that's often one of the, um, I would say, the rhetoric questions that come up. But aren't they pale? Like, do, don't those colors just, aren't they, you know, muted? Or And it's quite the opposite. Like, there's something I like to write about often in my books or talk about with my students. And that is like what I call like the Luna Moth colors where you think it's like you may have dyed something like say with citrus peels, like grapefruit peels or something, where it seems like it's a very pale yellow, but that yellow is so nuanced with, you know, literally like living molecules that it has depth to it and it has a glow that it's not a neutral, it's like a neon. And it will like pull your eye from across the room. It's like, it's a fascinating thing. And, uh, you know, it's both that part of the color component of natural dyeing that I think is fascinating because we've, I mean, we've basically starved ourselves, starved ourselves of these colors, um, you know, since synthetic dyeing came into favor over 150 years ago. Like we don't see these colors in our daily lives as much. And I think there's something really exciting about, um, you know, just thinking about tetrachromacy or like people being able to see additional hues that we may not have been able to see um, in the last few generations in the same way, getting acquainted with those again. And kind of like with taste where you have biodiversity for taste and that helps us evolve. I think the same thing for color too, is being able to see these colors and to start to notice um you know, nuances and new ways with how these colors work because they are alive. They have different molecules um, and, you know, they have different vibrancies and frequencies to them too, which I think is really fascinating. It is. And it's almost like when you have eaten a lot of junk food, like sugar and salt, and then you can eat, you know, a piece of fruit or, and it's like, oh, it's not, it's so boring. And I think the same thing with color, if you're used to this vivid <laughs> garish, <laughs> which so True. many of us are right. And looking at True. the natural color, it's just more, like it's you said, addiction. nuance. Yeah. 
<laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I know. It's, it's so true. And it's like, you don't look at, for me, when I die, like, you know, maybe pull out a number of different grays from a dye pot, they are not grays to me anymore. Like I will be teaching a class. I'll be like, look at that beautiful inky, like blue. And, you know, a woman will come up behind me and be like, that's great. And I'm like, are you, no, <laughs> you, know? you really do start to see things differently, you know? And, and I love it. Like it is, it's like, it's like nurturing, like another level of sensitivity towards color. So um, one question that comes up, and you can just touch on this briefly, because we are getting close to the end of our interview, um, is what about mordanting, to mordant or not? And I know you mentioned mm -hmm. um, low quats, you don't have to. Um, I haven't with avocado, but then I have a fear of alum. <laughs> and so I really, it took me yeah. forever to mordant, yeah. and I just started, and I can tell yeah. the difference. So what, what are mm -hmm. your opinions on that? Um. I have various opinions. You know, I try to work, especially with students, I work with where they're at, both in terms of skill level. And I think that's important for dyers too, to recognize like, you know, when you're just starting out, it is good to start simple and the less you can add into your dye bath, probably the better until you start to learn, you know, safe ways of working within your studio or working within your practice. And particularly, like, most modern natural dyers agree um, that working with alum and iron, in lim you know, in limited forms and in safe ways, like with gloves, with, you know, maybe good ventilation, or particularly if it's small particles with masks, um, is you know, considered part of, I would say, the modern day practice, but there are many natural dye books. And this is something to note for those who may be just getting into it. Like you could go to your local library and find a dye book where it mentions chrome and tin and, um, you know, copper, or various metallic mordants. Um, that should not be used for the home dyer <laughs> at all, period. Um, very, or, you know, for industrial dyeing either, you know, they're very toxic chemicals. And just because it's natural doesn't necessarily mean it's good for you. So these are all things to consider as well as with mordening. It's also ratios and thinking about like, for instance, iron, iron in small doses is something we take into our bodies as supplements, but on larger doses can, you know, lethally harm or um, injure or even, you know, kill a small child or a dog or, you know, so these are all things to consider as you're working and to know your materials. Um, I personally have started working with mordants in different ways um, because I too notice, you know, there is a stability factor that comes into mordanting um, with certain plants, not with every, not every plant is created equally. There are plenty of plants that don't depend upon additional, adding additional mordants, or there's ways you can mordant without um, alum or iron, which also are modifiers. So that means that they can change or help the dye bloom or can satin the dye and make like, you know, iron is considered a satining agent and alum is considered a blooming agent. So for instance, um, let's say not to come back to something simple again, but onion skins, you don't necessarily need to use a mordant with onion skins. It will give you like a bright, you know, yellowish orange. But if you add alum, you'll get a deep rusty orange. And if you add iron to that, you will get a dark green. And so that's how that dye bath can change, which can have benefits for creativity. It can have benefits uh, for the color itself and longevity. Um, so there's benefits mordening I would say but the way that you want to interact with it you want to um, you know you want to take care with it you want to make sure that you are not um, you know randomly ingesting an irritant into your lungs or into your skin and that you're keeping it away from roommates and small pets and animals etc um, I also have started looking into, like, I use very minimum in my recipes. I actually have done this on purpose. I've used a uh, minimum weight of what you would add in as a mordant to your dye bath or pre-mordanting your fibers as a way to just kind of minimize exposure. But also, if you can work with less, 
great, um, you know, because there's a fluctuation with alum where you can work with anywhere from 8% to like 20% to get a good result. So if I could work with 8% and still get a good result, you know, that's part of it, which is, um, you know, also something to consider. And then like properly following dye procedures. So most of that mordant goes directly into your fiber and you don't have much left in your water is a great thing too. So just like with recipes, with cooking for food, being able to make sure you have no waste because you've properly, um, you know, you've probably helped everything absorb or do its job um, is part of being professional as, 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 you know, as you can as a natural dyer. Um, and then, you know, I've, I've started to work with things too. It's just like, I personally am fascinated in the dyes that don't have additional um, mordants needed but you also need to think about that plant itself like is that plant toxic still even though you're not adding anything in you know you want to be considering all of these different factors and then you want to be thinking about what your own um, you know how comfortable are you in terms of keeping a safe studio space and you know making sure you're using the right proportions and measuring that out and you know, I've started to do all of my, um, you know, when I work with iron, I don't have it on heat anymore. I just do cold baths so that there's no fumes or vapors. Um, and I've started actually doing more cold baths with alum too. And just, you know, just kind of considering different ways of um, lowering energy impact, which is good for the planet and also lowering um you know, different ways that can be an irritant to me potentially um, as the dyer or as somebody who works with it on a daily and just, you know, thinking about, uh, you know, using lids, keeping things as energy efficient as possible, and then, you know, just coming up with systems that work and being smart about it. And if someone's wondering what the heck is a mordant, it, that's what binds the mm-hmm. color to the fabric, right? It's, yes. So mordant, uh, literally, it's it's a Latin word that means to bite, like mordant, like to bite down with your mouth. And so it's an agent that you can, you can use to literally help like the fiber molecule and the dye molecule create a solid bind so that it's not sitting on top of the surface or washing away or, you know, maybe even fading away with, with um, exposure to light even. It's a way that um, yeah, that you can fix the color to the fiber, but not all plants need that to be fixed to a fiber, depending on what fiber you're working and what plant you're working with. So this is another part of natural dyeing that is very specific, just like with, you know, again, <laughs> going back towards the food and towards cooking, like you wouldn't treat, um, you know, you wouldn't treat a carrot the same way that you would treat like or a raspberry because they're different. <laughs> and so getting to know each plant and getting to know each recipe and how that plant, say, bonds to that fiber, like some plants will work really well bonding to wool without an additional mordant, but to bond to cotton, it might need a mordant. And so there are, you know, again, there's a lot of nuances, um, but a mordant is something that helps the color bind. Um, and it also can act as a modifier, meaning that it can brighten the color or um, create a more depth to the color. And I would say, like, for anybody who's either just getting started in natural dyeing um, or who wants to know more, my friends who have a company called Botanical Colors, um, which is a great place to get just the basics to get started with natural dyeing, but to also get, um, you know, it's a, they're just an awesome resource in general towards morning and, you know, feedback on morning and they have feedback Fridays, which are really good. And so I would suggest, you know, it's like, that's a good place to start and to get to know more about, um, you know, what your options are as well as reading books. I would also say that. Um, and I don't go into morning as much in, in natural palettes, but natural color has a lot on, you know, the process of it. So Yes, natural color has been my plant um, natural dye um, guidebook. It's just great. I follow all your recipes. and Wonderful. Yeah, it's really <laughs> yeah, great. And, you, you. you know, with mordanting, too, what I've done since I did use alum was I just am reusing the water over and over. 
in the same bucket and then adding mm-hmm. new mordant. Mm-hmm. So that seems like it's been helping. And then lastly, before we close, I'm just curious, we talked a bit about um, toxic dyes. And one thing people I, I've probably heard and should know is that a lot of these dyes are polluting water. And so what do you do? Say you have your leftover dye. What do you do with that leftover mm-hmm. dye? You know, honestly, there's so many ways. It depends on what dye it is. Like some dyes may actually be good for your garden. And that is something (laughs) that I think is like, you know, again, a win-win. So depending on what you have in your dye and what you've created, like I've been working with seaweed dyes a lot lately, and I just love that seaweed is a fertilizer. And so that is a wonderful thing. Um, But, you know, depending on like how, like, say you want to empty out an indigo vat that you're no longer working with and your indigo vat vat has a very high pH level, you just want to mitigate that by adding in something that is acidic and being able to neutralize it. So thinking about pH levels is always important with your dye bath and being able to get like maybe little test strips. Um, and starting to understand, like, you know, what it is that's in your dye bath before you dispose of it, like, say, in your garden or down your drain, or if you have a septic system, you might have a sensitive, um, you know, you might have more sensitivity to how you dispose of things. So I would say, you know, keeping <laughs> keeping an eye on that before you get rid of your water is good. And then continuing to use your dye bath. And not making too much, I think, is also a component because the more you add uh, materials to a dye, for instance, the more they will be absorbed into the materials and be put to use. And then the dye bath will start to exhaust. So the more you have an exhausted dye bath, you know, again, the less you have to pour back out. Um, And then there's also like a lot of different ways that you can consider coming to the end of your dye bath, for instance, is sometimes what I do is I'll keep using a dye bath to the very end until like, you know, basically I've, I've exhausted it and then making sure the pH level is at a good level to be able to pour back into my garden. Um, Or if there's trees, particularly that like the iron supplement, if there's iron in it. But again, if you're using the right proportions of mordants, hopefully they've absorbed into your materials and there's not as much in the bath itself. Um, And then finally, I would say another thing is like that there are so many creative examples of using a dye bath or the dye materials to the very end. Like if you want to think full circular, um, being able to continue to like, you know, let your dye bath evaporate until you end up with a lake pigment essentially at the bottom and being able to paint with it or create, um, you know, other pigment aspects or even make crayons. Like people will do that from the end life of their dye bath Um, or paper, even if you still have the material itself, like um, my friend Deepa, who is a, she's a natural dyer and works at the UC Berkeley Botanical Garden. It was awesome to see what she did with the end of a sour grass bath. Is she created almost like a bioplastic with it at the end. And, you know, I've seen students do that with paper too from leftover. I know there's a number of mushroom dyers who've used the mushrooms to make um, papers from the mushrooms itself or crayons or pigments from the end of their dye bath. So, you know, there's a lot, there's still a lot of room for improvement in how we go, you know, full circular or zero waste in terms of end life of dye bath. But, you know, again, depending on what you're working with, a lot of it can actually be beneficial for your garden. You can neutralize it. You can keep working with it till the very end. You can share it with friends. Like that's another thing I've started to do at workshops is invite and invite participants to bring jars so that you continue to distribute what might otherwise have to get poured out on site somewhere. (laughs) And it's not usually convenient when you're teaching a workshop. So, you know, it's, there's like a social component even too. like, I have a lot of friends who will just drop dyes off to me or, you know, students will share with each other. And, you know, there's, there's a number of different solutions, I would say. It's so exciting. And you just, you, you are just such a, 
valuable resource for all of this information. I never even thought of mushroom dying. That's exciting. And seaweed. I'm like, new frontiers. <laughs> yeah. It's a new kingdoms that to explore. Is a world <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. So Sasha, do you foresee um, a natural color revolution in our future? And do you think, I mean, what would it take for industry to switch over? Do you think that's ever possible or would happen? You know, it has, just from my personal perspective, there are so many more people dying, naturally dying, than there were 10 or 15 years ago. But also the interest in it has really shifted in my, you know, again, in my opinion. Um, I think there is a stronger interest. And I do believe, like, there's so much potential coming further in the very near future, but further down the road in terms of, you know, collaborative aspects or what we discover about plants and their, their properties, or even the different ways like environmentally and um, culturally, we might switch and start wanting colors like aloe on our bed sheets because it's, you know, it has certain aspects that can give back to us for eight hours a night rather than a synthetic flame retardant dye, you know? Um, And so I think all of that is part of the shift in culture that I do believe people want and are starting to um, explore and invest in more again. Um, And I also do think that industry has questions around this and they are sincerely looking at different points of access of how to, innovate or collaborate or think differently, um, you know, or more, you know, in more circular um, respects or hopefully in regenerative respects where it gives back um, to the process, you know, and not just sustained. But I do think it's hard for a lot of larger companies or the fashion industry at large to use the current business model um, in place because, it looks different, <laughs> you know, <laughs> than what might be possible at the current trajectory and the current, you know, the current way things are set up are fairly, um, I won't say fairly, they are toxic and they are not sustainable or regenerative <laughs> on any level. And so I think there's a lot of change coming. I think that people are going to have to recognize the limitations I think that working with plant dyes helps, um, you know, helps to respect the limitations that we have, but also allows creativity within those limitations and allows autonomy or more um, independence in terms of, you know, how uh, how consumers can, um, you know, find more connectivity to what they have in their lives. And I think that there's a lot of potential there, Um, you know, and specifically for industry, like I do think what we're in our discussion before, I do think there is, um, you know, there is potential for thinking about waste on larger scales and maybe thinking about technological advancements or collaborations that come together to consider new ways of accessing like what otherwise might be pollution. Um, but I also think it, it, you know, a lot of this comes down to consumer behavior and, you know, maybe people just taking care of things differently and participating differently. Um, and that's behavioral. (laughs) So, you know, I think, I think it's, um, yeah, it's going to be a very interesting time Mm -hmm. coming up. Mm -hmm. And uh, I I envision millions and billions of people around the world walking around in glowing clothes. It would be amazing. (laughs) I love that image. (laughs) And so people can find out more about you at SashaDewer.com. That's Mm S-A-S-H-A-D-U-E-R-R.com. And we didn't even touch on the Permacotour um, Institute. You can find out more about that at your website. (laughs) Oh my gosh, another interview. (laughs) Well, thank you so much, Sasha. This has been so fun to speak with you and I've admired you for so long. So thank you so much for coming on to the show. Thank you for having me. It was wonderful to talk with you and thank you for your really thoughtful questions. I appreciate them. Thank you. (laughs) Bye. (laughs) Bye. 
You've been listening to a Sustainable World Radio podcast. You can find us online at sustainableworldradio.com and also on iTunes. For more information about permaculture and ecology, visit the Sustainable World Media YouTube channel, where you'll find videos about permaculture, aquaponics, organic gardening, rainwater harvesting, and much, much more. Sustainable World Radio is a listener-supported program. If you like what we do, please consider making a donation to the show. I'm your host and producer, Jill Cloutier, and thank you so much for listening. Mm -hmm.